Well, uh, I want to start off by getting a little bit of background on you, uh, okay. where you grew up and what life was like when you were a kid. I was, uh, I was one of four children. I was the oldest of four. Uh, my dad was a uh, career army officer, so he was in the military for 36 years, and consequently we moved every three years. It was a process of going to a new school, making sure you uh, beat up the bully and uh, <laughs> get to know new friends. And uh, so he's up there. Those are his decorations. He retired as chief of staff at Walter Reed. He, he was a Silver Star recipient as well? He was, was absolutely, World War II. Really? And yeah. Did he talk about his service in World War II? He much didn't talk know? a lot, no. I know he went in, he got the Silver Star with, uh, uh, with uh, having to do with D-Day. He went in, he was the first medical unit in uh, uh, Germany, he actually went in on a glider. And he hurt his back pretty severely, uh, uh, which bothered him the rest of his life. But uh, he was... Uh, uh, yeah, I, he was my hero. Yeah. And I'm sure that influenced how you viewed the military as you got approached, you know, 18. I'm sure that had to have affected... Uh, it did. Yeah, and plus growing up in the military. So, you, you know, all the kids you knew, their dads were, uh, or their mothers were in the, in the military. And so, uh, you know, yeah, it did influence me a bit. So when did you actually uh, go into the Army? I went into the Army right after I graduated from high school. I got into uh, the reserves uh, primarily because I was uh, I needed some money helping me get through college. So I was in the reserves for three years. I went in, I went in, in 1962 and uh, I, I was in the reserves for three years. During that time I was in, the, uh, in college also. Uh, and I uh, got commissioned when I graduated in 1966. And uh, when you get commissioned, is Vietnam on your radar at all in 1966? It is. It was, you know, it was all, uh, you know, as you got into, uh, you know, went through summer camp, uh, we went through jump school, uh, it was all we talked about, you know. And a lot of the guys that we were, uh, some of the instructors that uh, we had, uh, had been to Vietnam one tour, uh, there was a guy I went through uh, uh, jump school with who'd been back from, who was come back from Vietnam. He was with the 173rd. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say that that was on our mind. Sure, yeah. And there were Cuban, you know, we, I was in college when the Cuban Missile Crisis was, was going on. And actually the reserve unit that I was part of got basically put on standby because they were concerned that, you know, that the, the Russians had placed nukes on Cuba. And so uh, all the military uh, units, all the reserve units in the southern part of the country were placed on standby. So did you, uh, so you, I mean, you're going through airborne schools. Did you want to go to Vietnam or was that just something that? Uh, yeah, I volunteered to go to Vietnam, actually. I, I was initially assigned to a, a position in, when I got commissioned, I was assigned to uh, 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 unit in Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, and after about nine months there, I volunteered and, and I actually contacted a friend of my father's in the Pentagon and said, you know, can you make this happen? So, uh, yeah, I was, I was quickly shipped off to Vietnam. <laughs> Who'd you uh, ship out with? What unit? Uh, actually, I, I flew over in a big yellow Braniff. I thought, this is, this is crazy. I'm going to war in a big yellow airplane. Uh, and, you know, as we approached the coast of Vietnam, there was, you know, it was full of, full of other people who were coming in as replacements. Uh, you could see the artillery shells landing in the distance and the explosions. And, and I thought, oh, this is something to tell my kids. You know, I, yeah, I flew into war on a big, a big yellow Braniff plane. It looked like a banana. And, uh, you know, we had great, great stewardesses. It was wonderful. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's, I shipped over. And I actually uh, was assigned to the 4th Infantry at the, you know, replacement depot. How did the uh, guys from the 4th uh, Infantry treat you when you came in as a replacement? Did they accept you or...? You know, as an officer, it's a little different. But everybody who comes in is, uh, you know, the FNG, the fucking new guy, uh, you know, who's stupid and who doesn't know what to do and can get you killed if you're too close to him. And, you know, that was that was pretty pervasive throughout, you know, my two tours of Vietnam. 
you know, you had to watch out for the new guys. You had to watch out for, you know, uh, to make sure that, you know, they, they actually had their stuff together, that they actually, you know, had their weapons loaded, that sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, I was assigned to uh, a, an infantry platoon uh, as a uh, platoon leader, uh, you know, and there was, yeah, I'm sure, there was a little skepticism. Uh, among uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, among some of the non-commissioned officers. Uh, but my dad had, had told me, you know, sergeants run the, the military and, uh, you know, get to know them and listen to them. And I took advice. And uh, so, yeah, I, I got along pretty well, pretty quickly. And how long was it when you joined the 4th Infantry uh, before you actually started going out on combat operations? It was probably two weeks. You have an introductory sort of indoctrination when you're there at base camp, and then uh, you you know you go out with some uh, on on a couple of small patrols around base camp, and then you're assigned to your unit and you're out in the field. Now, uh, how long was it before you made? your first contact with the enemy doing these these type of uh, these patrols or these operations? Uh, you know, we were doing patrolling uh, in the Central Highlands. Uh, we were, uh, you know, aware of the enemy. You know, we had units uh, that were with our battalion. I was assigned to the 3rd Battalion, 8th Infantry. Uh, we had units that did get into contact. Uh, and I would say probably it was another three or four weeks before we actually got into a situation where we walked into uh, uh, a, a potential ambush. We actually uh, were uh, fortunate in that uh, our point man sniffed it out and uh, we were able to lay down some fire. Uh, so it was fairly inconsequential contact. The enemy broke and ran. Uh, but they did have a machine gun emplacement and a number of people around that, uh, that we brought fire on. And uh, now your first time under fire, uh, you know, what's that like as a new new infantry officer? It's chaotic. Uh, I mean, it's always chaotic. Uh, uh, you're, you know, first of all, you have to determine where your people are, you know, all of your people. Uh, fortunately for me, I had, yeah, I, I had a tendency to walk with the point man. So I was up in the front. I had a good experienced sergeant in the back. Uh, and, um, uh, I was able to know where he was, know where I, we had radio contact. I had my radio man with me. Uh, so we just basically, you know, went to the flanks and opened, you know, started laying down some fire, uh, didn't at that time didn't call in any artillery or anything I could have but I didn't uh, because it seemed like you know just a small patrol that we'd run into and uh, was combat in Vietnam what you expected it to be um, with the enemy and how they fought or uh, no you know what uh, we were basically told we were fighting you know farmers in black pajamas who came out at night and, and uh, did this and and in reality, in the Central Highlands, we were fighting. Uh, there were there were Viet Cong, but the majority of the time that we were in combat, we were in combat with hardcore North Vietnamese troops, and they had. Uh, I mean, they were well equipped. They weren't, you know, guys with SKS, uh, single shot rifles. Uh, they they had, you know, a, in my opinion, AK-47 is a better weapon than the M16. Uh, they had. Uh, uh, you know, uniforms, they had helmets, uh, you know, in one contact that, uh, that we had, uh, they had uh, flamethrowers, which we didn't have, uh, you know, and I can tell you when you're sitting on a hill and you see these people coming up the hill toward you and they got flamethrowers, it makes you pause. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, they, yeah, we were typically fighting uh, fairly well-trained, fairly well-equipped uh, infantry uh, people who were who had come down Ho Chi Minh Trail and were in South Vietnamese as North Vietnamese troops. Now, from that uh, first tour, are there any engagements that stand out in your mind as being, uh, you know, particular like uh, stand out just to you for uh, how they went down or um, anything that you think is important to your experience? I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
Yeah, I would say there were several. Um, there were, um, you know, a number of uh, really significant firefights. Uh, we were we were deployed to Dok Tho, uh, you know, which is right on the Cambodian border, and uh, we were basically going to be a blocking force. This is just before the Tet Offensive of '68. Uh, we were going to be a blocking force, uh, and we were patrolling very, very aggressively uh, to try to make contact and determine who was out there and what they were doing. Uh, you know, one of my best friends, he had his platoon uh, out in uh, an area that was, uh, I was actually back in the, what they call the trains area, where you had your medical and you had, you know, your, 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 your resupply and that sort of thing. I was back in the trains area when my group had been pulled off the line. Uh, and he was, uh, he was out doing a patrol and he got, he, he, his platoon, uh, simply ran into a NVA, a NVA battalion, you know, over five or 600 people. And I was listening to the thing on the radio and Charlie carried a shotgun, uh, uh, you know, we all carried our own uh, favorite weapons. I had a cut down uh, uh, 30 caliber carbine from World War II that I carried in addition to my M16 and, and a pistol. Uh, and uh, you know, you could hear Charlie yelling and screaming over the phone. I mean, over the over the radio. Uh, and The last thing we heard was uh, his shotgun, uh, you know, and a, and uh, and him yelling at the uh, guy that was in the process of killing him. So they wiped out probably the majority of that uh, platoon. My platoon went in uh, right away by helicopter to reinforce them, and we found three or four survivors. That was about it. It was about 27 people. So... Yeah, that was a pretty significant contact. Uh, we continued in that area, uh, and we actually uh, got into some very serious fighting. Uh, we were, you know, going up uh, several hills. We lost a lot of people. Uh, we actually, they they had to pull our battalion off and replace us with the 173rd because we had lost so many people. Uh, we were we were really uh, undermanned. Uh, that's that's when I got my first Purple Heart. Uh, we were in the middle of a firefight. I was behind a, a log with my radio man, and uh, I was trying to direct, you know, somebody to go flank this this group of NVA folks that was was in uh, in front of us, uh, and I uh, I saw a group that was right close by, and I pulled a pin on my grenade and I threw it. Uh, and at the same time, I heard a thump, and I looked down, and this was between my legs. It's an NVA grenade, um, <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I, I just, you know, I just said, okay, this is it. Uh, fortunately, he had not pulled the plug, so he did. He threw it, but he didn't pull the plug. Fortunately, I had pulled the pin on the grenade. So I killed him. He didn't kill me, or or my radio man. So my guys took this and de disarmed it. And I brought it home as a souvenir. So that's the exact grenade that. That's the exact like, grenade. Yes. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's uh, you know it's a wooden handle. It's hollowed out. It's got a fuse. You pull it. And it lights a fuse, and then this is what this is what explodes and creates the shrapnel. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. it reminds me. Every day is precious. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the the things that you went through, the memories don't they don't get any less emotional, no matter how long ago it was, fifty some odd years. Yeah, it's surprising. Well, uh, as a as a leader, as an officer, like when you would lose guys like that. Do you have time to process that at all, or? Uh, when you're in the middle of a firefight, absolutely not. You know, uh, as you uh, either withdraw or as you, you know, defeat the enemy or, or the enemy ex extracts themselves, 
uh, then you you know go around and you get your wounded out and you get your uh, you know you get your wounded out uh, 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 by by helicopter as quickly as you can to get them back to medical. Uh, you uh, you don't get your your dead out uh, until after the wounded are out, uh, unless the whole group is extracting. You know you're in a situation where you have to extract the entire group. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you wrap them up in their uh, in their poncho liners uh, or their uh, you know their their ponchos, and we didn't have body bags. Sometimes they brought body bags in, and uh, you you know you make note of who they are because you have to make make sure that that gets reported. And uh, yeah, you still I wrote a letter. Excuse me. To every kid's family, and those were tough. Those were tough, and I knew them all. I mean, I you know I got to know them. Uh, if we were out on patrol or or you know uh, someplace, I'd you know go around check everybody every night, uh, make sure they were you know their uh, their fighting positions were in good shape, and you know uh, and go out to, you know during the night and check and make sure somebody was awake. Because uh, they were two or three guys in a hole, um, or my platoon sergeant would do that, uh, and um, it was uh, it was tough. You said you were wounded. Uh, were you wounded very bad then? Uh, I don't know if I cut you off on that. Oh, when you got your Purple Heart. Oh, the the uh, the Purple Heart was another uh, another event. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, the Purple Heart was uh, where we were. We were actually on a, uh, in a at a fire base. What is, what is the fire base? Is basically where the uh, the central command is, uh, and then we have an we had an artillery. We actually got uh, this is um, this is probably late in my tour. My 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 unit or my entire company. The entire company at my unit was with was was in def was defense was defense, uh, and we were. Uh, you know, around the perimeter of the firebase, uh, we got attacked by a very large force. This is the same area on the Cambodian border that we were involved in, uh, and um, the um, uh, I got you know a mortar round landed you know right next to me, and I got shrapnel up and down my body, uh, and we were actually overrun. Uh, we ended up calling artillery strikes down and our strikes on ourselves. You know, we got into the bunkers. Uh, the the Viet North Vietnamese got into the bunkers. Uh, they actually took over, uh, or we, we spiked the guns because they were going to take over the artillery unit that was there. Uh, and so we ended up that night uh, calling because we had uh, we had all kinds of air resources. We had this is right before Tet. Uh, <clears throat> we had Spooky up, and they were shooting you know all kinds of ammunition down. Uh, we had. Uh, Number of airstrikes. We had uh, our, our artillery was firing as fast as they could. They eventually, you know, came into the perimeter. Uh, we spiked the guns. They took over the artillery. Uh, we had some quad 50s up there. They, they, uh, we had to burn up because they were going to take those over. Uh, and we ended up going uh, once they, uh, they never, they, they overran us. Then we called artillery and airstrikes on ourselves. Uh, then they pulled back, uh, but there were still North Vietnamese in our within our perimeter so we had to go bunker to bunker and basically do uh you know not hand to hand but basically you know spray at it yeah throw a grenade in that sort of thing so yeah there were a lot of us that were i was wounded there were lots of people on that hill that were wounded so yeah i remember uh i had a very close friend uh his name was rad r-a-d dutton and uh, he was a lieutenant, and uh, I remember uh, after uh, when we were about to be medevaced, he he popped up, and he was covered with blood. I was covered with blood. He thought I was dead. I thought he was dead. We gra we uh, grabbed each other and, uh, and gave each other a hug, and uh, that was yeah, it was tough. It was a tough tough night. So I assume that was the end of that that first tour, though. You getting wounded like that, or I got wounded. I got back, um, and um, 
Yeah, I think I think that was uh, they they medevaced me. Then I came back to my unit. Uh, they brought in my replacement, and I and I went back to to the states. Yeah. And uh, when you got your Silver Star, was that the second tour or was that the first? The Silver Star was the second tour. Oh, okay, uh, so we'll get, we'll get yeah, to that. The, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I saw no, Bronze Star too. Is yeah. Go ahead. Oh, the the Bronze Star too. Was that? Which... Yeah, I got a Bronze Star. I got a Purple Heart from that event, and I got a Soldier's Medal, uh, which is basically the highest award you get for life saving because I I pull somebody out. Really? Yeah. Wow. So uh, when you go back to the United States, are you, are you thinking I want to go back to Vietnam? Or can you take me through what that, uh, what that period was like, really, I guess? Cause I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I just, you know, I went back. I was assigned to, uh, actually, I, I, I had, I had uh, requested to go to ranger school, so I went to ranger school. Uh, then I was sent back to uh, Fort Lewis, basically as a training officer, to, uh, to be a training officer uh, for... Uh, reserve units that were being called up and uh, and and sent to Vietnam uh, and that was that was kind of anticlimactic uh, you know it was kind of miserable <laughs> you know I knew where those guys were going and I you know the, the interesting thing is you once you're gone you feel like you're you're you should be back uh, you know that's where all your friends were that's where your men were uh, you know you needed to take care of them uh, so I had that, you know, that same sense of, I not, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. Somebody else is supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be back there. Uh, so uh, actually, it was kind of a a a, a, a funny situation that led to me actually requesting to go back. Uh, I was uh, a, a training officer. There was a. Uh, a medical unit that was sent to Fort Lewis from Cincinnati, uh, and they were basically uh, they were a National Guard unit. So they were really they really needed some training up, and so they assigned me. Uh, they asked me to go and even though I was an infantry officer, go and and train up this medical unit. So I got them out in the field. Uh, you know, I did a number of things. So there was, uh, there were a couple of officers, including a major who was like the quartermaster officer. So I had taken his people out in the field. I made sure they understood about booby traps and you know this kind of thing. And um, and so the uh, uh, the the higher headquarters said, okay, we need to get these people out in the field, have them set up all their equipment, do this, that, and the other. So I had arranged to uh, to have a. a position uh, that they would go out and set up their their tents and ap actually start operating as a mass unit without any casualties except simulated casualties uh, and the first thing you you needed to do was to uh, because it was under simulated combat conditions so you had to go in and secure the site so I said to the major uh, okay I'll take a small group of people that I'll train up and we'll go out and we'll secure the site uh, at about you know five o'clock in the morning and then everything else is loaded up in the trucks and you you take you know the convoy out there and set things up so we, that's the way we were going to do it so about five o'clock in the morning i was down there uh making sure that everybody had blanks in their weapons because we were going to have to do simulated combat and uh he came down and he was very gung-ho he's very excited about going to vietnam uh and he had on his you know battle uh gear and uh, he he said, oh, 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 can I can I have a clip for my 45? I said, no, sir, you cannot. <laughs> he, so he goes back because he's the quartermaster officer. He goes back and he brings out this this box of uh, uh, tear gas grenades. It's the kind of thing that at that time, given what was going on in the United States, that the National Guard would use, and they were called, uh, they were they were Bakelite, they were almost like plastic, and you'd throw them up and they'd explode and the tear gas would come down. And he said, uh, he said, well, maybe we gotta take a couple of these. I said, no, we don't need any tear gas grenades. So uh, I, I, you know, I put them back on the shelf and I got my guys together and we went out and, you know, we had a machine gun and, and we, you know, we, we fought the aggressors off. That was nothing. You know, it was kind of funny. Then I get this call from uh, the Sergeant Major 
and Sergeant Major says, Lieutenant, you got to get back here. We're in big trouble. And I said, what, what's going on? He said, you just, you just got to get back here. So uh, it turns out that the Major had gotten everybody, you know, gotten everybody in, and being gung-ho, he had gone back down in there and gotten a, a, one of the hand grenades, uh, the, 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 C, the C4 hand grenades, uh, and then he had gotten in his Jeep and he had a radio that he was supposed to talk to me on and it was connected to the Jeep. It was bolted to the body. And he took the cord and he put it around and he put it also on his web belt up here. And so, and he had his clipboard because he always had a clipboard. You could tell he was definitely not a combat officer with a clipboard. Uh, and so they're rolling through the post, the main post, about seven o'clock in the morning and uh, at about 12 miles an hour. And um, the, you know, just about the time that people are going to work or kids are starting to you know, walk to school, this, that, and the other, they're right in front of the elementary school and he drops his clipboard out of the Jeep. So he doesn't want to stop the convoy in the middle of the road. So he jumps out of the Jeep to get his clipboard, not realizing he's still connected to the radio that's attached to the Jeep and the Jeep is still rolling at about 10 miles an hour. So he reaches down to get it and it pulls him off his feet and he realizes that he's connected to the Jeep by the microphone cord. So he tries to pull that, instead he pulls the grenade. It goes off, blows off two fingers. The convoy has to stop. The tear gas goes over to the elementary school. <laughs> I get a, I, so I, I arrived at this scene you know, and there's a three-star general who's standing there going, who the hell is in charge of this goddamn ragtag outfit? And I I said, sir, the, the captain that, that's being treated by the medics is. And he said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm the training officer. And he said, Lieutenant, you've got three minutes to get your ass and all of these people out of my goddamn street. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> the captain ended up not going to Vietnam, they actually changed his orders, and after his hand got patched up, they sent him to Alaska. <laughs> and I, so after that event, and when they, you know, they finally sent another major out that night, um, I called up uh, my immediate superior and said, I gotta get back to Vietnam. It's too dangerous back here. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, uh, and, and, and I had been waiting for a position uh, with 101st Airborne, so I was, uh, I was shuttled off to Vietnam uh, and uh, became commander in the 101st. And what year is this now? This would have been uh, 69, 69, 68, 69, yeah. So uh, when you're going over there the second time, though, there's a pretty big gap between, you know, 66 and 69. Uh, how is the, you know, public uh, discourse about the war changed, or has it? Uh, it's gotten much more uh, anti-war, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, it was... Uh, uh, it was getting to point. I, I don't think Kent State had happened yet, uh, but it was. It was quite. You know, uh, there was quite a lot of opposition. Uh, I can remember. You know, when I came back from my second tour, and I was talking to my dad because I had an offer. They were going to send me to Baylor and get me a, give me a master's degree, and uh, promote me to major. Uh, I said to my dad, "What do you think?" And he said, "No, get out." He said, uh, you know, right now it's bad, it's going to get worse, it's going to be soldiers and dogs keep off the grass. So uh, he gave me that good advice, uh, which is why I decided not to con continue in the military. Can you tell me about that, that tour with the 101st as a company commander and uh, kind of what that looked like? The 101st was a really, you know, it was a strac outfit. Uh, they were they were gung ho. They were they were all airborne troops. Uh, you know the main uh, uh, my main one of my main concerns uh, was that everybody was so gung ho that I had to sit down with my medics because each platoon has a medic and and then the company has a, a, a senior medic uh, and say look guys there's 30 guys in those platoons 29 of them can can shoot their rifle you're the only guy that can patch them up. I don't want you throwing your medical bag down and grabbing a, a 
Tommy gun or, or a, you know, M16 or something. You can carry a personal weapon, but I don't, you're not, your main thing is to patch people up. So, you know, I had to continually reinforce that because everybody was very, very aggressive. Uh, and, you know, they were trained to be. Uh, it was a good, it was a very good um, outfit. It was very well, very well uh, trained, very well uh, managed. Well, uh, when you guys go out in the field as a company commander, uh, what is your, uh, I guess, what is your position when you get maybe into like a firefighter or something like that? Uh, I don't know if there's an instance that stands out in your mind of what, what you're doing when you're engaging the enemy as a company commander. Uh, you're, you're basically controlling things and you're also, uh, you're also uh, managing uh artillery strikes, you're managing uh, uh, air strikes, so you're talking to former air controller, uh, you're talking to the artillery people back in the back. Uh, you know, the main thing is to understand your map uh, and to know where your units are um, and who's in contact and who needs to be, you know, who needs to go in uh, over, you know, you move five clicks um, south to help a unit that's already in in uh, uh, in contact. Uh, you need to have good communication with your platoon leaders, so that you under. Yeah, I mean, you obviously can't see them. You can't see what they're doing or what they're going through. So they have to all. That all has to be word of mouth con conveyance. And if they're stressed or if they're under fire or if they're, um, you know, frightened or something like that, you 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 got to you know manage their fear. Man can, you know, tell them, you know, look, you know, it's okay, control your troops, you know, tell me what's going on, let me know exactly where you are, get out your map, tell me exactly where your front lines are, because if I'm going to call an artillery and airstrike, I don't want to call it in on you. Uh, when I was a platoon leader, there were a number of times where uh, I had napalm in front of my position that really was uh, singe my eyebrows. Uh, it was that close, and I was very happy about it because <laughs> it was burning up the guys that were trying to get to me. So uh, you know, but you, you know, you don't want to have green on green act activities. Uh, so you got to, you know, you got to get really good communication. You got to get really good feedback, and you got to really know, you know, your map coordinates. So I would say those are the keys. Uh, also, you know, you got to have really, really good. Uh, non-commissioned officers because they're they're the guys that really you know help you help you run things uh, I was very fortunate I had a very good uh, first sergeant uh, in the field and then uh, about two months into my tour he rotated back to the States and uh, I had uh, I had a sergeant uh, kid kid out of San Francisco State uh, and he was extraordinarily gung-ho uh, I mean he carried an old 45 grease gun. I don't know where he got it. I don't know how he got ammunition for it, but he always had it with him. Uh, his name was Buzz Kind, and uh, and he was. Uh, he, I I made him my field first sergeant because uh, the first sergeant I got in replacement was great guy, but he was near the end of his 30 years or 20 years. Uh, he was about 100 pounds overweight, and when I went back to meet him. Uh, I flew back on helicopter to base camp and I looked at him and I said, you know, how old are you and, you know, your weight and and I said, I said, okay, you're going to be my first sergeant, but you're going to stay back here and you're going to get into every single supply officer uh, and supply sergeant because I said, I got kids out there. We were the tip of the spear, but we were the end of the, we were the very end of the uh, supply line. So I had kids out there running around with their ass hanging out of their of their britches because they you know their their fatigues were wearing out the soles were coming off of their boots and I would yell and scream and I wasn't getting much back and so I said okay I'm going to send you a list every Friday and if what I need is not on that is not on that helicopter coming back to me your ass better be and I'm going to have you out on the field here uh, you know seeing seeing the problem so every Friday from then on I had I had new uniforms if my guys needed them. I had new boots. I had a hot meal if that was available. I had a bottle of scotch every Friday for the colonel. Uh, I was I was the Cosmo of uh, 
the second of the 501st. <laughs> you know, I had officers, uh, not, not, yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if they were, I had officers that were uh, friends of mine uh, who were not married, who would go on R&R &R, uh, to various sundry parts like Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, and they'd come back with uh, the clap. And as an officer, that is literally a, a serious offense. Uh, so I would, uh, I was the guy that they could call up and my medic would go over there with a penicillin shot because I had access to penicillin through my supply sergeant. <laughs> Most medics don't have penicillin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was pretty, uh, pretty comfortable. If, if I needed something, I could get it. This guy was great, Sergeant Hammes. Well, uh, can you tell me about the uh, the Silver Star action and uh, kind of how that came about? Uh, we were um, we were involved in a in a pretty serious firefight, uh, and uh, I was up with with the lead platoon, uh, and we uh, pulled back. Uh, we we didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, extract the units. We just pulled back a little bit, and then we set up a fighting position. Uh, and we had uh, a listing post out in front. And uh, there were, I think, f two guys in in two positions out in front. And we got attacked that night. Uh, and it was a pretty serious attack. I lost contact with the two guys uh, uh, who were out in front of me. And so I took my medic and I went out uh, to check and see if they were alive, if they were dead, whatever. One of the kids was dead. Uh, the other kid had been badly wounded. Uh, as I was, this is my second Purple Heart too, uh, as I was uh, leaning down into the hole to pull him up, there had been a sniper out in front and he shot and it went through my neck and it went through the medic's chest. And uh, uh, so I, uh, you know, I pulled both of them out I was able to drag them back to the, the unit and get them medical care. Uh, they both survived. Um, and uh, so I, I got a purple heart and a silver star. <laughs> well, can you uh, describe to me what's the sensation of getting shot through the neck? I can't imagine. It's like somebody hits you with a baseball bat. It, you know, basically, you know, or if they hit you in the shoulder or if they hit you in the chest, you know, it's just like whack. And, and it, it feels like, wow, what the hell was that? Uh, and then, you know, you, you reach up and you go, oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, there was nothing else to do. You know, my medic was at a sucking chest wound. I was able to, you know, put something over that and wrap him up. And, and the other kid was in worse shape. Uh, so, you know, you just do what you do. And when you're doing that, uh, how do you physically feel? Or do you feel... Like, like you've been shot in the neck as you're trying to drag those guys out? Or no, you... there was adrenaline was was surging. You know, I I, uh, uh, I was able to call in an airstrike uh, and, uh, you know, lay down some napalm in front of us for whoever was out there, whatever was out there. And, uh, you know, so I was, I was just, you know, my mind was racing uh, uh, to try to, you know, do, do the things you need to do in the immediate time you needed to do them. So uh, I didn't really uh, know how bad my wound was until I got back and, you know, the senior medic who was, you know, with me, uh, not, not, he, I had, I'd taken one of the, one of the platoon medics out. Uh, he looked at it and said, we got to get you out of here. We got to get your, you know, you're bleeding out. So. Uh, Did that end your tour in Vietnam or? No, it didn't. Actually, I really? went back. I got stitches. Uh, you know, I was uh, I was in the medical uh, tent for you know uh, back in the uh, evac hospital, 79th evac hospital for a couple of weeks, and uh, then I went back to my unit uh, and finished out my tour. Was there anything else in the, that last bit of your tour that you think is important that should be recorded or shared? Uh, you know, that was a time period where you had fragging of officers and uh, you had uh, lots of racial issues. Uh, 
I never, I was fortunate. I never had that. I, you know, I, I knew, knew all of my men. Uh, I think they respected the fact that uh, as a captain, uh, if I was told that, uh, you know, because a lot of the times they would send units out simply looking to have somebody uh, stumble onto a larger uh, unit uh, of the enemy uh, so they could pinpoint where they were and then bring our air power and our artillery power. And literally, so you were a pawn. You were really a pawn out there. Uh, in many cases, you were out there to, to get shot at. Uh, so that we, they could hone in on who was shooting at you. Uh, and there were a number of instances where, you know, my, uh, my superior people, that you know, the people who were running the battalion, would say, okay, we want you to go from Hill A to Hill B, uh, and there's this valley in between, and we think there's an NVA division or a regiment or something like that. And I thought, holy crap, you know, I've got... 76 or 78 men and you're going to send me into a situation that's got 500 or 600 of the enemy uh and uh you know we would we would sometimes do that and we would sometimes go instead of from hill a to hill b we'd go from hill a to hill x to hill b and go nope didn't see a thing <laughs> uh and my my men realized that and you know i i i was not going to put them in a situation where I, th I felt that, uh, you know, they were being used as collateral, so. Were there any issues with drug use? I've heard that was a problem with some units. There was. Uh, you know, I had some great guys who uh, smoke weed, you know, and I knew they smoke weed, and I wasn't upset about that because if you had a guy who smoked weed and you got into a firefight, he could get himself together enough to defend it, to defend his position. If you had a guy who drank heavily, and there was booze all over the place, who drank heavily, and he got in a, you know, and you got in a fire fight when he was drunk, he couldn't do squat. So I said, if you want to smoke weed, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything about it. You know, now I had a couple of guys who used coke, and I, and those guys I tried to, you know, get back to, off the line and into medical so that they could do something, you know, about them before they got fully addicted. I, you know, I don't know if that had a difference because it's probably more prevalent back there than it was, you know, out in the jungle. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I was aware of that. Uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, everybody smoked. Cigarettes were free. Uh, you know, they came with a, with a accessory pack for your sea rations. Uh, you know, I'm, these guys were out there in the jungle. It was raining, you know, particularly during monsoon. It's not only rain, but it's cold rain. And, uh, you know, you can't find any, hardly any cover. Uh, they were, uh, you know, constantly on guard, uh, you know, against attack. If they went back to base camp and they, you know, they, rot they rotated the units back after, you know, a couple of weeks. So you'd get out of the field for a couple of days. They were treated as if they were extra hands to do crap work and and, and as a uh, as a lieutenant i had really taken i'd drawn the line and said no i'm not gonna let that happen uh and as a captain i definitely drew the line on that you know if somebody came into one of my platoons and said you're go you guys are going to go out there and build this bunker on the perimeter of the base camp uh you know they pick up they you know they 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 they'd find me and i'd go back and i said that's not going to happen you know, that's not going to happen. You just go find somebody else to do that. Uh, there was one time when I was a platoon leader that uh, it's kind of funny because uh, the we we got told that we had to go out and uh, and build a new bunker on the perimeter of the uh, 4th Infantry's base camp. And they showed us where they wanted it to build. And, it, you know, we, we built all kinds of bunkers, so we just started digging. And it was raining, and it was muddy, and everybody was, you know, nobody had a shirt on. And uh, so this major comes by, and he goes, uh, what are you people doing? I said, well, we're, he didn't know I was an officer. I, uh, I, uh, uh, so I put my jacket on and showed him my, you didn't wear any, any, uh, uh, rank recognition, uh, typically officers would put it underneath their collar 
And if they needed to, they'd flip it up. So I flipped it up and I said, I'm Lieutenant Crosby. And he said, uh, he said, the, uh, he said, well, that's in the wrong spot. I said, no, sir, it's exactly, I can show you the stakes that they told us where to put it. He goes, no, no, it needs to be uh, five feet over that direction. He was obviously a new staff officer who had just gotten to Vietnam. You could always tell the new guys because they, you know, when they move you by helicopter, the guys who'd been there forever would sit in the door like this, you know, with their feet hanging out, and the other guys would like hold on to something because they were afraid, because the doors were never open. I mean, they're never closed. So, uh, you know, they were afraid they were gonna fall out when the helicopter did like this. Uh, anyway, the major, uh, and you could tell from his fatigues, they were all, yeah, they were all, they weren't muddy. Uh, so I'm covered with mud, and he, and, and he said, yeah, you got to move it 10 feet. I said, yes, sir, I understand that. Uh, and I said, but what we need is, I said, the engineering unit that's attached to the base camp here, uh, as part of the division, has a hole mover. And I said, they, they will bring that out, and they will move it over 10 feet. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I said, they need you, they, they'll need you to go with the engineering battalion and tell them they need to bring their hole mover out so they can move that. And I said, my guys have dug this hole, so they'll just move the hole over. Of course, that was, there's no hole mover. <laughs> so he wanders off. We finished the bunker in Amscray. And uh, I don't know whatever happened to the major or whatever, you know, he probably in, uh, got, got, uh, his, his face into a full colonel engineering type and the engineering type said, you want a what? <laughs> you know, it was like a left-handed monkey wrench. Uh, so, uh, you know, there was always those kinds of things. I, I did not like going back to base camp. Uh, you know, invariably uh, you would uh, you would encounter some, you know, there were people back there that were living in connexes with air conditioning uh, you know, there were officers who had, uh, you know, boxes of, uh, uh, you know, uh, starched fatigues because they had a housewife, uh, I mean, not a housewife, a house girl, a house boy who was ironing up, shining their boots, this, that, and the other. It was a whole different world. I, you know, I, 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 one time I went to, I got to Saigon because, uh, this is when I was a lieutenant, uh, we were, uh, we had a kid that was bit by a dog because there were all kinds of little dogs all around. You know, and the, and, you know, a 19-year-old kid. I love dogs. You know, he loves dogs. That's sort of. Anyway, he got bit, and they were concerned that the dog might have rabies. So I had to. They killed the dog. They cut his head off. That's how you tell. They put me on a chopper and said, "Fly down, find a medical unit that can do this." autopsy on the dog, not an autopsy, but basically check the dog and make sure he has rabies. Uh, so I flew down there and I got off the helicopter and I'm, uh, you know, I got a Jeep and I was walking down and I had, I had given them the dog's head. They were going to give me the report the next day. So I was uh, going back to the uh, bachelor officer's quarters and uh, I, I am completely covered in dirt and dust. Uh, you know, and the SMP stops me and he goes, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, because I had weapons, I had three or four weapons hanging off me. And he said, G you know, General Westmoreland says, your uniform has to be pressed, your boots have to be shined, and uh, you know, you cannot carry a personal weapon. And I flipped up my collar and I said, I, I said, I said, sir, get out of my face or I'm gonna shoot you. <laughs> And the guy who was with me said, yeah, he will. <laughs> so, so, you know, those kind of things. I had very, very little. And that night, I was, I was in the bachelor's officer's quarters, and they came up and they said, we expect to be attacked tonight. And there was one uh, sort of a sandbag position in front of this building. It was a four-story building. And there was one MP in there. And they said, well, we need officers to go down and pull shifts to back him up, just in case. And so I was rooming with two pilots, two Navy pilots. So they brought, I, of course, I had all my weapons. They brought these two M14s up and they showed them, they gave them to the Navy and said, okay, you've got the shift from 10 to 11, you've got the shift from 11 to 12, you've got the shift from 12 to 1. And these two guys who flew jets, uh, you know, they look at these things and says, what the hell do we do with these? <laughs> they didn't know how to load them, they didn't know how to shoot them. So I said, you guys, you sleep a good night. Have a good night's sleep. I'll go down and pull three-hour shift because 
I wouldn't sleep when you guys were down there. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was down there chucking and jiving with the MP. And we had a good time <laughs> drinking coffee and watching the street to make sure nobody got attacked. <laughs> So you talked about it a little bit. Uh, when you get back from that second tour, um, you know, what is that adjustment like, uh, you know, reintegrating yourself back to uh, America? And it was tough. Um, you know, they, they flew us back to McCord Air Force Base uh, in Seattle. Uh, we were told we had to change into uh, a Class A uniform. They had a Class A uniform, but, it, you know, obviously... Uh, and and fortunately they you know put the rank and this that and the other on it uh i got uh, uh i actually flew back with a guy that i had known in basic training uh and you know we'd gone through uh, uh summer camp together uh just you know i didn't even know he was uh, in vietnam and so we were you know chatting we got a cab together to go to SeaTac because i was going to fly back uh to uh, uh illinois uh, where my wife was, um, and um, we were in the back of this cab, and we were chatting away, and, you know, we are obviously in uniform, and as we get out, the taxi guy, well, he was he was listening to us, and, and he said, you know, the only thing you guys mean, because uh, apparently, you know, the country was in some kind of recession also because of the war spending, so the only thing you guys mean to me is more unemployment. And I thought, you son of a bitch, you know, and then, uh, uh, and then, you know, you got in the airport, and there were people protesting. Uh, you know, when I went to apply to graduate school, I was still in the military. I, I was in uniform I, and uh, I got, uh, 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 you know, I walked, I was walking by to the, to the bursar's office. So I was registering for uh, class and uh, I got spit on. And so, you know, I that kind of thing I you know those two gentlemen ended up on the floor with cuts and bruises and their table and all of their pamphlets got kicked over <laughs> but you know wasn't me <laughs> couldn't have been me <laughs> so uh, now as you look back on the Vietnam War what do you think about your experience and kind of what that event means or I guess what's it what's it mean to you Ooh, that's a tough question you know I mean I I I, I wouldn't give up those experiences that I had and the people I got to meet and and uh, and the things I got to do um, I think you know America has unfortunately not learned the lesson that there are wars that we shouldn't do that we shouldn't go into uh, that was certainly one you know it's the old story uh, you know in Vietnam you 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 had the government that was uh, asking you to do this stuff, but you go out in the in the jungles or you go out of the mountain yard villages and we went we we did a lot of work with the mountain yards, uh, or you go out to uh, just the small uh, uh, villas uh, villages, uh, and all they cared about was nobody raped their wife, nobody killed their buffalo. And nobody molested their kids uh, or burned down their hooch. That was it. I mean, they didn't care who was in power as long as they could grow rice and their buffalo was good and their kids were okay and their wife was fine. Uh, and I think it's, you know, that's the same situation in so many areas where we end up being, going in to be the good guys, ending up to be the bad guys. So, you know, and I think if, uh, you know, First of all, we have too many politicians who've never served the military, uh, so they don't have that experience. You know, they can beat their chest and and you know send kids off to for foreign lands and and kill you know black and brown people and and other people. Uh, uh, they should you know they should be the first to go, or their kids should be the first to go, so they understand the the, the reality of it. There needs to be an understanding of warfare. Uh, and the cost of all warfare. I mean, you look at you look at the statistics. About 22 or 23 percent of the kids that came back from Vietnam were classified by VA as being disabled. Of some, you know, 10 percent, 50 percent, 70 percent. 
that's an ongoing cost to the American public. It's an ongoing cost to their families. Uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, 47% of the kids who went over there came back disabled, either because of the IEDs or because of the fact that we've developed more weapons that can, that can do more harm to the body. Plus, we've also developed more medical treatments. We get them off the, we get them off the battlefield into the medical tent a lot quicker. So you've got kids that would have otherwise died on the battlefield in World War II or, or even Vietnam that are now coming back and they're, you know, they're, maybe they're missing two limbs or maybe they're missing both legs. I mean, they're going to be a, uh, they're going to be, a, a, it's going to be a problem for them and their families for the rest of their lives. And and yes, we, we, are, we, we deserve, they deserve our support and we pay them every month for their disability. But by the same token, uh, you know, we, I mean, there's a, there's a huge cost. There's a huge residual cost. I mean, we see it with the number of kids that commit suicide. 22 still, 22 veterans a day commit suicide. So uh, it, it, you know, I mean, I still have nightmares. You know, my wife, I've, I've been diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, my wife will wake, wake me up and say, you know, you're, flailing around, you're yelling, uh, you know, and I'll be back. I'll be back in the jungle. So uh, it's, uh, we don't, we don't think about that. We just uh, beat our chest and, and, and send off the military.